The Devil's Plan with Globalization. Would you like to know the Devil's Plan for Globalization? First, let me remind you that we humans are not the only ones who are interested in our world. God is even more interested in what happens to his creation. Likewise, the impostor prince is also interested in the events that are transpiring on this planet. Lucifer has definite, clear objectives, and it is advisable for us to know something about them, in order to know the nature of the final conflict into which we are already entering. The battle for the control of our planet has already been raging for thousands of years. Beyond the humanity devised plans for global control on an economical, political, religious and military level are spiritual powers. Although invisible to the human eye, these powers are greater than any human resource able to lead, guide and manipulate even the most powerful human agencies to accomplish their own purposes. This is reason enough to request divine guidance before studying this subject. We want to fulfill the will of God, to participate in the divine agenda and not be deceived so that we might actually participate in the devil's agenda. First of all, who is the devil? Before speaking about his dreams regarding the globalization of this world, let us say something about him. The Bible says that his name was Lucifer, which means Shining One. That name was not given to any other being in the Bible. He was unique among angels and held a very high position in heaven. After his rebellion, his name was changed to Satan, which means adversary. Nevertheless, he still tries to masquerade himself as an angel of light. It is easy for him to masquerade as an angel of light because most of the world represents him as an awful and horrible being. Really? Yes. They believe that this is his true appearance. They even treat him as something to be trifled with. It is amazing to see that while the world, in general, is genuinely concerned with dangers of terrorism, it shows little concern that films based on terror are a form of entertainment for millions of people in the world. Video stores have entire sections devoted to terror and horror which indicates how many people enjoy that kind of film. It is evident that the world is more fearful of what human beings can do than at what these supernatural creatures called demons in the Bible are capable of doing. But let us unmask at once the devil's plan for globalization. He is trying to unite the entire world to obtain here on this earth the supremacy that he was denied in heaven. He fought in heaven to gain the admiration and homage of all the creatures of the universe in the very place of God's residence. Because he was unsuccessful, he came to this world to fight for the same purpose. He wants all the world to worship him through a human representative on earth. Will the devil reach his purpose? Revelation 13 verse 3 answers, yes. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. No nation, no human being follows an animal, but the term beast is here a symbol which represents the cruelty of Satan's highest representative here on earth. They worshipped the dragon. Who is the dragon? Satan. The world worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, 
And they also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Revelation 13, verse 4. In other words, both the dragon and the beast are worshipped. The dragon is worshipped through his son, that is, through someone who masquerades as Satan himself does and pretends to occupy the place of God on earth when, in reality, he is the representative of Satan on earth. The dragon who had given authority to the beast. The dragon represents Satan. This is clearly expressed in Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9, but it has a dual application. It represents Satan and at the same time the Roman Empire through which the prince of this world persecuted the followers of the Lamb, the followers of the Lord, that is, the people of God. However, in Revelation 13 verses 3 and 4, the dragon gives authority to a prince that succeeds the Caesars of the Roman Empire so that both the dragon and that prince could be worshipped. Why is this prince or kingdom represented by a beast? Because the kingdoms of this earth are represented by ferocious beasts. Someone said that man is the most terrible beast on earth. The beasts kill to eat, but men kill for sport. This is the reason why in order to represent the kingdoms of this world, God chose more than just common animals, but true monsters like this beast with seven heads and ten horns. No wild animal alone is enough to represent the cruelty of the kingdoms of the earth. Revelation 13.12 repeats this transference of power in connection with the time of the end. A new ruler or government also empowered through the leadership of the dragon, made the earth and the inhabitants worship the first beast that had received authority from the dragon, from the Roman Empire through which the devil exerted his despotic dominion, Revelation 13, verse 12. Finally, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. How many? All. Does that include the United States of America, Russia, Germany, South America, Africa, Asia? Yes. All inhabitants of the earth will end up worshipping the highest representative of the dragon on earth, who is commonly referred to as the Antichrist. The world will give homage to the Antichrist without realizing that they will be worshipping through him the rebellious angel, Satan himself. Will we also end up worshipping the devil through his Antichrist? Not so. Fortunately for us, while the majority of the world will fall into the devil's trap, those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, a remnant will escape his snares and be gathered into the kingdom of God. The devil wants to dominate or govern the whole world. In my book, The Seals and the Trumpets, I include some statements of Ellen G. White that unmask the pretensions of the devil. Let me read one of them on page 369. Satan says, The world will become mine. I will be the ruler of the earth, the prince of the world. The earth will be holy under my dominion. Do we want to know the dream of the devil? Here it is. He wants to rule the whole world. Let's look at how he wants to do that. He wants to govern the earth through an earthly prince who represents him on earth, the Antichrist, a political religious prince because he receives, like the dragon, the worship of, his, of this world, an homage that belongs exclusively to God. 
The kingdom of the Antichrist is represented by a beast because it reveals the deceptive and cruel character of the evil angel. It has to do with a political religious kingdom that revealed the ferocious characteristics of a monster in history, a characteristic that it will demonstrate again in the closing scenes of this world's history. Revelation 13.7 says that the Antichrist was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. The word Catholic means universal. So, we may say that it has to do with a Catholic kingdom which embraces the whole earth. In John's words, the Antichrist exerts his influence over the whole earth. He seeks supremacy and adoration through deception. We studied in a former message how he deceives the world. Through great prodigies and miracles. Let us read here just one text to keep this uh, fact in mind. Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14. He performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men, by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast. It deceives those who dwell on earth. Lucifer wants to occupy the place of God. He wants to supplant the Lord. He is not yet permitted to occupy the place of God in person. He has to do it through human agencies to whom he can transfer his low attributes of deception and murder. Isaiah 14 verse 12 says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How? inexplicable. When you find some people who do inexplicable things, you say that they are crazy. The same happens with Lucifer. What he did and what he does have no explanation. How did he rebel against God dwelling in the midst of the angels of God? There is no reason for sin. Satan will be finally destroyed without being able to explain his evil behavior, without being able to give an acceptable explanation, without being able to justify his iniquitous and wicked actions. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High, Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14. Let us consider the fifth point. It is a derivation of the former one, but we will consider it separately because it has to do with how his attempts to occupy the place of God are reflected in human beings. To those who succumb to his influence, he gives the same spirit of self-exaltation. He deceived our first parents by telling them literally, you will not die, a primitive pretension of natural immortality, but you will be like God, Genesis 3 verses 4 and 5. Can a serpent, a dog, a bird be like us? Of course not. It would be useless for them to try to be like us. But we, human beings, often try to do what animals don't do. We try to be like God to occupy his place. All philosophies which pretend to develop a special power within our minds, a supernatural power, like parapsychology, theosophy, and other uh, bizarre sciences, conceal the same venomous fruit of the serpent. How did all this mess get started? In the book The Great Controversy, Ellen G. White wrote that pride in his own glory nourished the desire for supremacy. Instead of gratefully glorifying the Creator for bringing him to life, Lucifer coveted the glory and admiration of the universe which corresponds only to God. We are told that Satan had at first concealed his work under a specious profession of loyalty to God. He claimed 
to be seeking to promote the honor of God, the stability of his government, and the good of all the inhabitants of heaven. While instilling this content into the minds of the angels under him, he had artfully made it appear that he was seeking to remove dissatisfaction. When he urged that changes be made in the order and laws of God's government, it was under the pretense that these were necessary in order to preserve harmony in heaven. But there had no disharmony in heaven, no fight. This comfort was introduced in heaven by Lucifer, and he appeared to be trying to solve the problem he himself had created by requiring the angels to accept his proposition, his ideas. An old lady went to watch a tennis match, and when everyone was silent, she started to protest. Take out the net! Take out the net! Don't you see? that it bothers the players. She didn't know the rules of the match. So also those who try even today to put aside the lie of God don't know the rules of the game. The devil tried to take out the law of God, but without that law, no creature in the universe can fully enjoy God's creation. He denounced the divine statues as a restriction of their liberty and declared that it was his purpose to secure the abolition of law, that freed from this restraint, the host of heaven might enter upon a more exalted, more glorious state of existence. Finally, bitterness and resentment led him to rebel openly against God. Folks, being guarded against resentment, here in this world of sin, we will always find reasons for bitterness and resentment, because we will always be the object of unrighteousness within and outside the church, because we live among, uh, among uh, sinners, and unrighteousness will exist in this world until the coming of the Lord. All evil, the devil declared, to be the result of the divine administration. The discord which his own course had caused in heaven, Satan charged upon the government of God. Finally, he accused God of being severe and tyrannical. By the same misrepresentation of the character of God as he had practiced in heaven, causing him to be regarded as severe and tyrannical, Satan induced man to sin. The same spirit that prompted rebellion in heaven still inspires rebellion on earth. Did God offer a solution to this problem? Yes. What was that solution? The cross of Calvary. When we know the nature of evil and learn what God did to meet the problem, to save the world, we are astonished at what God did. The bloody death of the Son of God was offered for the sinner's life. This world was lost, delivered to the rebellious prince. We were subjected to a slavery from which we could never be freed. What a sadness! What a pain for humanity! If God did not do something to make us free, we were condemned to be slaves forever. God was willing to do something contrary to what the usurper prince of this world tried to do by exalting himself in the place of God. Since that time, we know that God can humiliate himself and be degraded to the point of becoming a human being and die the worst kind of death, being nailed to a cross to save his creation. In this way, the cross of Calvary revealed the divine self-denial and humility. It was seen also that while Lucifer had opened the door for the entrance of sin by his desire for honor and supremacy, Christ had, in order to destroy sin, humbled himself and become obedient unto death. The cross of Calvary, while it declares the law immutable, proclaims to the universe that the wages of sin is dead. In the Savior's expiring cry, it is finished. The dead knell 
of Satan was rung. And not only the death knell of Satan was rung, but of all those who, like Satan, yield to that spirit of self-exaltation and supremacy. The great controversy which had been so long in progress was then decided, and the final eradication of evil was made certain. The good news is that despite the fact that Satan is currently trying to unite the world under a complete globalization, he is an overcome enemy. The fact that he doesn't want to give up is another matter, but he was overcome by the Son of God at the cross of Calvary. How was this accomplished? By a sequence of events on the earth that initially thought to be a failure, a defeat, that the disciples felt was the end of all their hopes. But while the followers of the Lord cried when they saw their lovely Lord dying on the cross and finally exclaimed, Father, it is finished. News of these events was passing from world to world throughout the universe, causing joy and happiness because they knew that the greatest victory of the universe had been won for the salvation of this world and that the universe was eternally safe. Who since then could put a stop to the heavenly admiration and exaltation of the Son of God? Now, the guilt of Satan stood forth without excuse. He had revealed his true character as a liar and a murderer. It was seen that the very same spirit with which he ruled the children of men, who were under his power, he would have manifested had he been permitted to control the inhabitants of heaven. The eyes of the entire universe were opened. The question was open to all. Was this then what Lucifer would have done among us in heaven if we would have allowed him to remain here with all his wicked ambitions? Some governments on earth show themselves to be beautiful, attractive, but after a while the people are disappointed. Struggle for supremacy exists in every prince of this world. But our mission is not to seek our own glory. We are called to exalt the creator and redeemer of this creation at a global level. This call to the world to give glory to the creator and the redeemer must reach every tongue, people and nation. Let us deal with a sixth point. The devil wants to be rid of everyone who resists his supremacy. This is the common trend of all those who strive for supremacy. When he cannot do it by hook, he seeks to do it by crook. He tries to destroy, to damage the reputation of the sons of God and of God himself. One of the attempts of the devil is to denigrate the character of God. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman, says Revelation 12, 17, and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. They are those who obey God's commandments and have the testimony of Jesus, and says Revelation 12, 17. We are very familiar with this text because we believe that it deals with this last generation, especially our people who attempt by the power that they receive from above to keep the commandments of God and honor his name. After the resurrection of Christ, the devil tried to destroy the followers of the Lamb. At the beginning, the Roman circus became a place of entertainment for the people of Rome who, who came to watch wild animals devour Christians who did not deny their Lord. But as the centuries went by and the Caesars were replaced by the popes, Persecution of dissidents became even worse. Says Revelation 13, verse 7, he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. Who? Yes, Satan, through a human counterfeit on earth, namely the Antichrist, because the devil may rule over human beings through other human beings to whom he has succeeded at imparting his attributes. 
he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Revelation 13, 15. Put the word Antichrist instead of beast there, and it fits perfectly. The word beast is a symbol. He also forced everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or in his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. Get off this planet, all those who don't want to submit to my principles of government, said Satan. This is the real intention of the devil, according to what the Bible warns us, that of being rid of God's people. When he thinks that he has all the world under his dominion, and knowledge in him instead of God, he realizes that there is a people who obey the commandments of God and honor the Lord, and therefore he wants to destroy them, to eliminate them. Because as long as there is a people who resist his supremacy, he will not be able to take complete dominion of this creation. The devil wants to cause the plan of salvation to fail, and in this way to dishonor God and damage his reputation before the universe. We were just mentioning something about this. Let us say something more now. If God is unable to lead a people to their final triumph, then what God did to save the world is a farce. If the Lord comes and finds no one fulfilling the purpose of his creation that consists in glorifying the Creator, then his plan of salvation would have also failed as well as his plan of keeping the universe in peace. Because that failure would leave a doubt in the minds of the creatures of the universe, and the rebellion could sooner or later start again. The devil tries to leave God without a single person to represent him in this world, and attain for himself the honor he was denied in heaven. In order to distract the attention of the people from the need of preparing to live among the angels of God, he pushes men to make war among them. Let us see how he ruled the world throughout the centuries. Satan rules through the early princes. The first emperor of the world after the flood was Nimrod. Genesis 10 verse 8 says, that he was a mighty one on the, on the earth. He founded Nineveh and Babylon, the capital of two future empires. He delights, Satan delights, in war. When Jesus came, he made clear a difference in his system of government. According to him, how do the rulers of the nation treat their people? He said in Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28, that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercised authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. What a contrast! The kingdom of Christ is not based on an arbitrary dominion, but on the principle of service. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away, said Jesus. He didn't compel or obligate the people to kneel before him. Thanks to the gospel, some governments are for a time not as cruel as others because they reveal the principles of Christ's gospel. In Revelation 13, 11, we see at the end a government that is represented by a lamb, not a wild animal, a noble symbol of the kingdom of Christ. Unfortunately, that government would end by speaking like the dragon, a symbol of the kingdom of the great adversary, the devil. Let us consider the Egyptian empire. According to historians, 
the state receives a cult, and the person who as the divine pharaoh embodies it receives also a measure of worship. Look at this. The devil wants to obtain through his representatives on the earth what he tried to obtain in heaven. The pharaohs were sons of the gods and required a kind of religious call to be applied to their person. The pharaoh has the title of high priest as being the image of the divinity and confers upon himself the attribute of uh, infallibility. I don't think that the pharaohs believe that they were gods. They simply wanted to exert such a dominion that no one could dare to contradict them. They sought an absolute authority. Wow, this system of leadership could be coveted by some husbands who don't want their woman to challenge their ideas through discussion or by the bosses of some business enterprises. But this shouldn't be so. This is the style of government exerted by monarchic and absolutist nations. Not so with you, said Jesus. Now let us consider the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence, said Nebuchadnezzar, by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Daniel 4, verse 30. We may see here Satan's principle of government. Pride is me who made this city. Greatness. God humiliated him. In my book, The Apocalyptic Times of the Century, in chapter 4, I gathered many texts that portray the state of things just before the fall of the different kingdoms surrounding Israel. The kingdom of Israel was not an exception. The moment came when they fell under the same deception. God, therefore, had to humiliate them. We see God through history breaking the pride of princes and the nations, sinking their earthly human greatness and ambitions like corks, which uh, despite this, just keep popping up again and again. God had to humiliate those kingdoms to hinder the devil from taking complete dominion over this world through those arrogant kings. History tells us that the king of Babylon was worshipped as high priest. The kings brought sandals that the overcome kings used to kiss. Let them kneel before me and kiss my feet. The kings could dispose of the lives of their subjects as they pleased. The Empire of Persia. Historian says that when Cyrus entered Babylon, Persians showed their respect for him by worshipping him for the first time. Their subjects were willing to honor their kings. When I see some people praising a politician, a ruler, sometimes even a preacher, with such a passion as would elevate him to a semi-god rank, I think that those people don't know the principles of the kingdom of Christ. Well, everyone is free to admire earthly rulers. But let us be careful not to elevate anyone into the place of God. We are told that the great Persian king was the absolute honor of power. The highest god on earth. All must kneel at his feet, putting their face toward the earth. Greece, Alexander the Great, a young man, under democratic regimes like ours, it would be hard to find someone daring to boast the title great. Even so, similar titles still persist in our century. We will see this in a moment. Alexander became the living incarnation of divinity and required from his own the proskinesis to kneel. But uh, he was paradoxically a slave to wine. Rome, the fourth universal empire represented in the visions of Daniel. 
the Caesars. The Caesars rested on the autoritas in his sacrosanct power of Pontifex Maximus and in his divine descent. They placed their statues in the temples and squares of Rome close together to their gods. All wanted to be like gods, acknowledged and remembered as gods. Was not this a similar proposition that the serpent came to offer to our first parents in Eden? You will be like God. In the fourth century, Constantine was the first emperor who converted to Christianity. Even so, he kept the practices and principles of paganism in his imperial system of government. He rebuilt the imperial cult, which was unbelievable, nominally accepted by Roman Christianity. Roman Christians were ready to accept Constantine as their supreme leader simply because he put a good face before them, yet without yielding to his presumed divine rights that he had received from paganism. He kept the titles of the former emperors, like Augustus, Pontificet Maximus, Imperator Perpetuo, Pater Patriae, but he wanted more. He adopted titles related to Christian beliefs, like Vicarius of Christ, Bishop of Bishops, representative of the only begotten Logos, the Word of God. Constantine mixed paganism with Christianity and elevated the power of the Roman Emperor to the apogee of uh, absolutism. He imposed a rigorous ceremony tending to bring out the divine character of the Emperor. The ceremony included a golden tunic, a diadem, and the requirement of proskinesis, kneeling before him. What was the result? the Roman Catholic Church, with the same kind of ceremony and honor to the Pope once the Bishop of Rome replaced the Caesars in that old capital. The Popes in the 6th century inherited all the imperial titles and others added still more titles for them. Holy Father! His Holiness. These are blasphemous titles because they reveal his intention of occupying the place of God on earth. The popes also required the proskinesis. This custom came from the emperors. The popes didn't receive this ceremony from Christ. Their inheritance came from the princes of this world, from the Roman emperors, because Jesus didn't require the people to kneel before him despite the fact that he was really the authentic Son of God. Let us read how the book of Revelation foretold the coming of those Christian princes who would adopt blasphemous titles. Revelation 13.1, Revelation 13.3 He had blasphemous names on his heads. The beast, Antichrist, was full of blasphemous names. What is blasphemy? The attempt to occupy the place of God, to accomplish a role pertaining only to God. The Apostle Paul foretold the coming of the Roman Antichrist. Let us read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come, the second coming of Jesus, unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, the church, displaying himself as being God. The attempt to occupy the place of God in the midst of Christianity would happen in history as a result of the apostasy. What is apostasy? The loss of the original faith of Christianity. This apostasy came through Constantine who paved the way for the exaltation of the popes in the place of God. The popes pretend to have the authority to forgive sins. Why does this fellow talk like that, said the Pharisees of Jesus. He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Mark chapter 2 verse 7. Now let me ask you a question. Did Jesus blaspheme when he 
forgave the sins of the handicapped man? Of course not. Why? Because he is God, Emmanuel, God with us. How can a human being pretend to forgive sins if he cannot read what is in the human heart? This is the reason why only God can forgive sins. King Solomon prayed, When a prayer or plea is made by anyone among your people, hear from heaven your dwelling place, forgive and act, since you know their hearts, for you alone know every human heart. Let me repeat it. For you alone know every human heart. 1 Kings 8, verses 38 and 39. How can I forgive the sins of others if I cannot read their heart? I can forgive the harm others might cause me, but the only one who can absolve sinners from their sin is God. This can be accomplished only by the sinner and in only in direct communion with God, opening his soul to him in all sincerity. He pretended to change the law of God. The prophet Daniel foretold this. Let us read Daniel 7.25. He shall think to change the times and the law. It is noticeable that Pope John Paul II offered a renewed catechism where it is stated that the second commandment which forbids veneration of images is valid for all times. But some pages later, Catholics are assured that a Christian council in the 7th century allowed veneration of images and therefore Catholics are permitted to offer a culting adoration to virgins and saints. The papacy also changed the day of worship which is prescribed in the fourth commandment. But the law of God cannot be changed. The law refers the seven-day Sabbath as being the day of the Creator, not Sunday. This changes, no doubt, the greatest blasphemy because the Pope's dared to change the law of God himself. Actually, the Pope nullified the second commandment, veneration of images, and changed the, the fourth commandment from Sabbath to Sunday. Let us go back to the papal title, Holy Father. What did Jesus say? Do not call anyone on earth Father, for you have one Father and He is in heaven, Matthew 23, verse 9. This means that God is our only spiritual Father. The Apostle John wrote, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband will, but born of God. John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. Nicodemus, he told, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. John 3, verse 5. We are converted to the Lord. We become sons of God, not sons of the Roman Catholic Pope. He cannot grant spiritual life. When my son Daniel was 10 years old, I asked him if he wanted to be baptized. He looked at me uncomfortably and said, No, not yet. I was a little startled. For the first time, I was realizing that I was his fleshly father, but that I couldn't be his spiritual father. I considered what could happen if he answered me in the same way year after year and finally be lost. No, I want all my children to be in the kingdom of heaven and be saved. But without God's intervention through his spirit, so that a decision was born within his own heart, I could do nothing. I am his fleshly father. He came from a human decision. But concerning his spiritual life, only God can give it to him. The next year I was given an evangelistic seminar in Puerto Rico, and my daughter told me, in our return to the pastor's house, 
Daddy, Daniel wants to be baptized tomorrow. I turned my face and looked at him and told him, not without a certain hesitation, really? His face shined as he smiled and said, if not now, when? We both sobbed during the ceremony. What a wonderful God! My son had a father in heaven! For spiritual matters, God is our only father. He is the only one who can beget spiritual life. He was working in my son as he did it in me as at his age. He was adopting my fleshly son as his spiritual son to become a subject of his heavenly kingdom. Folks, all my, all my preaching, all that I can say and do is useless foolishness in the words of the Apostle Paul for those who are lost unless the Spirit of God intervenes and begets the spiritual life in those who hear my message. And if your heart is being touched right now, know that it is not by my power, but by the power of the one who works through my words and converts souls. Holy Father, your holiness. Would you dare to kneel before a human being who pretends to occupy the place of God and his son, confess your sins to him and call him Holy Father? What a blasphemy! who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Revelation 15, verse 4. God alone is our Holy Father. We are sanctified by Him, but we don't have natural holiness. We lost that righteousness through sin. The Apostle Paul testified that the Lord came to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. 1 Timothy 1, verses 15 to 16. In my youth, I thought that Paul was showing himself of, as being humble. How could he say that he was the worst of sinners? But when I grew up, I could understand that he was not a hypocrite. He was a murderer who consented to kill Stephen and persecuted Christians. He knew the kind of old man he had to master. The closer we come to God, the more insignificant and unworthy we feel, and grabs the abyss there is between God and man. If the one who even now enjoys being called the Holy Father, His Holiness, was really close to God, he would reject with horror at the people who kneel before him, asking him forgiveness while calling him Holy Father. But he accepts all of this adoration. He adopts, even today, imperial worship ceremonies. The Apostle understood that the only one worthy of exaltation is the Son of God. He wrote to the Philippians, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to that, even dead on a cross, Philippians 2. I don't know if we would trust a little son to a tribe of cannibals, to grow up among them, and to become their redeemer after being crucified by them. But this is what our Father who is in heaven did in order to redeem us. The contrast between the heavenly life and the life he had to bear here on earth cannot be compared with any human illustration. The faithfulness of his son to fulfill the will of God was admirable. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. I will give all my homage and honor to the Son of God, not to any human being. I will kneel before him, the only one worthy of any praise and glory. I will throw my crown at his feet and kiss them, because he is my only Savior. He is the only one who redeemed me, giving his life to give me eternal life. Will the devil attain his purpose? For a short moment, God will allow him to take complete dominion of this creation, except in the faithful remnant which will be protected by invisible angels. The devil will be given the chance to reveal his horrific character at the highest level. But this will be for a short time, because the Lord will intervene, this time forever. The Apostle Paul said in his first letter to the Thessalonians that the Lord will come to be glorified by the believers. The devil will not be able to destroy those who believe the last faithful remnant that the Lord keeps in the midst of a rebellious world which is subject to the will of Satan. Let us read together the words of the Apostle John in Revelation 1 verses 5 and 6. To him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us exalt our Creator and our Redeemer. Let us kneel before his feet. Let us kiss his feet because he is worthy of all praise and honor forever and ever. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in certainty of faith. We come to you because we know that you are worthy of our veneration, of our uh, worship, of our adoration. We want to praise your name for all eternity. And we want to kneel before you, knowing that we are uh, insignificant, but uh, we expect to be accepted because you are a lovely Father. In the name of Jesus, we ask you all these things. Amen. Amen.